Merry Christmas Eve to one and all. It's been a little while since I've done one of these documentary or podcast style videos, since not only do not many people watch them, but the last one caused me quite a few headaches after YouTube deleted it and put a strike against the channel before changing their minds upon appeal, but still refusing to let the video be monetized. Which, for those of you who don't know, that means not only do you not make any money out of the video, it's also not promoted on anyone's homepages, so essentially no one gets to watch it. All that, I might add, because apparently acknowledging the existence of a certain despicable leader of Germany between 1934 and 1945 is apparently considered hate speech. Anyhow, Christmas is supposed to be a time of forgiveness, so I shall forgive the flawed YouTube algorithms and have another crack. Ahead of the festive season, I asked if there were any videos you would particularly like to see on the channel over Christmas. Scott suggested seven players who were born on Christmas Day, which will be out tomorrow, whilst Dylan suggested getting Scott Brown on the channel. Sadly, the Celtic skipper hasn't returned my DMs, so instead, I'm taking on a suggestion from Josh to do one of our mini documentary style videos about the 1914 Christmas truce. When I had a recent meeting with my YouTube partner manager, she showed me that whilst the general public despise these rambles, they're actually among the most popular videos with the 200 odd thousand people who subscribe to the channel, and I feel as though I ought to honour the most loyal followers of the channel if you enjoy these videos. Of course, if you don't already subscribe, Christmas is not just a time for forgiveness, but also a time for giving. And if you'd like to give a like and subscribe to the channel, I suspect you would be blessed going into 2020. The story of the 1914 Christmas truce is one which is difficult to escape. It is referenced in numerous Christmas songs, as well as in film and on TV, in everything from Blackadder Goes Forth to the 2014 Sainsbury's Christmas advert. It's a tale that appeals to so many of our senses, and it's notable that in Britain at least, you would struggle to find someone who didn't have some knowledge of the 1914 Christmas truce, but you would find it much easier to find someone who had no understanding of why the First World War was fought and why Britain took part at all. Over the years, the stories of the Christmas truce have been embellished, romanticised and overplayed, but also underplayed and occasionally dismissed altogether. There's actually a very good reason why the full first-hand accounts of the truce have been sketchy and hard to obtain, but we'll come to that later in the video. So today's video is concerned with sorting the facts from the fiction or finding out the truth about the 1914 Christmas truce, you might say. And for those of you who are thinking what on earth does this have to do with football, almost all popular references to the truce in film and on TV pay particular interest in the suggestion football was played between German and British troops. In the final episode of Blackadder Goes Forth, Captain Blackadder says, Remember it? How could I forget it? I was never offside. I could not believe that decision. When Baldrick asks him if he can remember the truce football match. So we'll take a look back at the truce's football links with particular attention. The First World War began in July 1914 when Austria declared war on Serbia. And by August 4th 1914, all the major European powers had become involved in the conflict. So December 1914 was the first holiday season away from home for troops on both sides during the war, and the first at all for many on the front line. When war had begun in the summer of 1914, each of the major nations believed that the fighting was only likely to last a few weeks, but more than a million soldiers had already died in just five extremely long months, albeit many of them on the Eastern Front. What is referred to as the 1914 Christmas Truce took place on the Western Front, and wasn't one all-encompassing event as its name somewhat suggests. The Western Front was pretty long, and the truce was essentially a series of interrupted and unofficial ceasefires which took place at various stages along the trenches. For some, the truce would be a momentous moment which altered their view both of the enemy and of the conflict in general. For others, the fighting was never even interrupted, and conflict continued throughout Christmas Day. The first recorded ceasefire had actually taken place a couple of weeks earlier, on December 11th. In this instance, there had been a truce between the 2nd Essex Regiment and the 19th Saxon Corps, who met halfway between the trenches in no man's land, retrieving dead bodies and telling each other how fed up they were. This was an isolated incident, but the idea of a truce wasn't alien to troops on either side. In fact, it had even been suggested by the recently elected head of the Catholic Church, Pope Benedict XV, but was quickly quashed by generals and more senior ranking officials who firmly opposed the idea. December 1914 had been a very wet month, making trench warfare a living hell. The unrelenting downpours made everyday living a misery, in addition to the obvious horrors of war that already existed. The trenches had been flooded for three weeks in the build-up to Christmas, but the rain stopped on Christmas Eve. It was replaced by freezing cold temperatures, which you may think would be dreaded for the troops, but it was actually welcomed. 
the frozen ground made conditions much more livable and was much preferred to the unbearable flooding, and the freezing was soon followed by snow. The improved conditions combined with the gifts both sets of troops received at Christmas somewhat raised morale. The German troops each received a Christmas gift of cigars or pipes from the Kaiser depending on their rank, whilst the British forces were sent a brass gift box from Princess Mary which contained a packet of tobacco, a packet of cigarettes, Christmas cards, and a portrait of Princess Mary herself. I don't know about you, but if I was risking my life in what was essentially a suicide mission in the most unbearable of conditions, I sure would be grateful to receive a photograph of a princess back home. In addition to the state-issued gifts, families were also allowed to send their gifts. From loved ones, British troops received things like sweets, plum puddings, and yet more cigarettes, whilst the German and Austrian soldiers received plenty of cognac, salami, and chocolate. This was a war that was supposed to have been over before Christmas. A swift and glorious victory had been promised to the men on both sides, with many talking of their urgency in wanting to get out there before the enemy's inevitable impending surrender. Those actually on the front lines knew any end was a long way from sight, and a million men had already lost their lives just five months into the conflict. On the Western Front, the British had sustained the heaviest losses with the tactics of climbing out of the trenches and slowly walking towards machine gun fire, proving to be as effective as you would imagine. The change in the weather and the gifts from back home did provide a rare tonic for troops on both sides, and whispers of a ceasefire returned. Senior British officer Sir John French caught wind of these suggestions and quickly issued an order that no unofficial armistice would be tolerated, sentiments which were echoed by the top brass on both sides of the trenches. On Christmas Eve, across much of the Western Front, Austrian and German troops could be heard singing the Austrian Christmas carol, Still a Nacht, Heilig Nacht, better known a Silent Night to You and Me. Initially, this prompted the British troops to break into their own chorus of Silent Night in a form of competitive caroling, before the two sides began to merge and sing in harmony. This spontaneous caroling was the first step towards a Christmas truce across much of the Western Front, and it was followed by soldiers shouting Christmas wishes across the trenches. German troops began displaying lit Christmas trees above their trenches, and they were reportedly the first to shout, British, tomorrow, if you no shoot, we no shoot. Still on Christmas Eve, some particularly brave soldiers even wandered into no man's land waving newspapers as a gesture of their commitment to the troops. This was incredibly dangerous, and there were instances of British troops misunderstanding German advances and meeting them with machine gun fire, killing unarmed German troops. Along some sections of the front line, peace would never be possible, but this was a rare exception, and in large swathes it would. It is all too easy to anglicise both world wars, so I shan't make that mistake here and it's worth pointing out that there were identical scenarios taking place between German and French troops as well. Even Indian soldiers, who were unfamiliar with the Christmas festival, were able to deduce that it must be a Western equivalent of the Hindi festival of Diwali, and they too largely joined in with the truce. Soldiers of all colours, creeds and nationalities awoke on Christmas morning to clear blue skies as the rain continued to stay away, and there are accounts from some soldiers that the weather was simply too nice for fighting. Some British troops reported waking to find German troops roaming freely around no man's land, an act of supreme trust and good faith without which a widespread truce may well not have been possible, and the British soon deserted their trenches to join them. The iconic scene of soldiers meeting on no man's land is a little less romantic where one accounts for the bodies of fallen soldiers that coloured the landscape, but both sides holding mutual burials and paying joint respects to the dead was perhaps the most poignant aspect of the entire truce. Some soldiers exchanged gifts with the so-called enemy, whether it be beer in exchange for chocolate, clothes swapped for cigarettes, or buttons, which were particularly popular gifts. Up and down the line, some soldiers on the British side are said to have brought footballs out from the trenches and began to kick them about in no man's land. Quite why there were footballs in the trenches, and who brought them, remains, to the best of my knowledge, a mystery, but there are too many accounts of their existence to be dismissed. The idea of a formal match in which there could be anything akin to offside as mocked in Blackadder is one which can be dismissed. For the most part, footballing activity was limited to knocking the ball about and kicking it between one another. The exception to this is the account of an actual game between the Highlanders of Scotland and a Saxon regiment which may have been the closest thing to a proper match in which scores were kept. The conversations between opposing troops provide a scathing insight into the futility of not just the Great War, but almost every war. British soldier and later a best-selling author Henry Williamson recalled his memories of the truce in an interview with the BBC during the 1960s. 
Williamson, who was just 17 years old in December 1914, remembered reading the words for Vaterland und Freiheit, for fatherland and freedom, on the German ration boxes. Aghast, Williamson asked the German how on earth he could be fighting for freedom when the Germans had started the war and the British were fighting for freedom. Both soldiers quickly realised they had both been told they were fighting for freedom, and they had both been told that they had God on their sides. This comradeship persisted in some sections of the Western Front for a few days, but nowhere was a ceasefire maintained beyond December 30th. Corporals, field marshals, and generals on both sides were incensed to hear of the widespread armistice, including one or two that you may have heard of. French officer Charles de Gaulle, who later became President of France, described his fellow soldiers' actions as lamentable, whilst German Corporal Hitler, who later rose to power in Germany as Führer, had banned his soldiers from partaking in any form of a truce and was outraged by the mere suggestion. Many senior military men feared the enemy had a trick up their sleeve, whether it was poisoned cigarettes or spiked alcohol. There has never been any known evidence of such trickery having taken place during the truce. For the most part, though, they were just terrified about how the realisation that the enemy had almost identical experiences to them, the goodwill, and even friendships formed during the truce, would damage the soldiers' efforts going forward. To combat this, a number of British officers ordered a 24-hour artillery barrage on the Germans immediately after Christmas Day, and put out a warning that any peace-seeking troops would be court-martialed. There are also claims that generals tried to prevent the stories of the truces spreading further than those who had been directly involved, attempting to intercept messages home, detailing the ceasefire, and looking to censor coverage of the event in the newspapers. Some have suggested this may be why the truce didn't gain popular prominence up until the 1960s, but if true, censoring reports of the truce proved pretty futile, since plenty still exist. Goodwill to all men didn't last long after Christmas. By the following December, an already bloody and devastating war had turned even uglier, as sickening chemical gases, civilian casualties, and far less camaraderie between troops set in. The sad reality is that by December 1915, there were few troops still alive from the famous truce of 1914. Some accounts suggest that those who were involved in the truce were put in particular danger due to the threat senior ranks felt they presented to morale, but they were already on the front line of a conflict orchestrated with a suicidal zeal. The war was supposed to have been over by Christmas 1914, but in truth, it had only just begun. The truce came just five months into a war that would last 51 months in total, and although a million lives had already been lost by the time of the armistice, an estimated 40 million soldiers and civilians had been murdered when the conflict finally came to an end in 1918. The communication between British and German troops was largely facilitated by German troops who had previously lived in Britain and consequently understood both the language and the culture and some British soldiers recall German troops asking for updates on the Football League's results and standings. The causes, the reasons for fighting, and the justification behind each nation's participation in World War I is a matter that still divides historians and experts on the topic to this day, but as with almost all wars, the architects of it were not the ones on the front line. The differences between the men following orders to slaughter one another were slim, and the 1914 Christmas truce proved that. That's it for today's video. I thank you all for watching, I know these videos aren't for everyone, but similarly, I know there is a small group of people who really enjoy them, and hopefully, I can grow that contingent. There will be a slightly cheerier video uploaded on the channel tomorrow for Christmas Day, but if you don't manage to tune in for that, I shall wish you all a very Merry Christmas now. Thank you all for watching, please go ahead and like the video if you did find it interesting and enjoyable, and there's no time like Christmas to give the gift of subscribing to HITC7s.